Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland. <clears throat> I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at our Devo 30. And if you're in the neighborhood, like to come on by. We're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Especially before you begin your, your day, uh, it's a good, good way to, to start. Morning, Katie. Good morning, Dina. Good morning, uh, Patty. I'm going to do this. Sorry. Um, Today we will finish up the book of First Thessalonians. We are in chapter 5, and Paul's continuing on in, uh, with this message of the Lord's return. So let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to just bless us today. Lord, as we begin our day, we thank you, Father, that, that you never sleep or slumber, Lord God, even while we're asleep. And, and that's a pretty dangerous place, I would think, Lord, when you're not aware of your surroundings, when you're knocked out, and, and some people sleep, uh, pretty deep, Lord, and they, they wouldn't wake up if a train hit their, their house, Lord. <clears throat> and yet, Lord, you're up watching over us. You have angels around us, Lord, and I thank you for that, Lord God. You're always there, Lord. <clears throat> and Lord, we want to we wanna just start today with just lifting up a, a, a few people, Lord, that we love very dearly that are a part of this church, Lord. Uh, little Johnny, Father, who's uh, 15, going to be 15 years old, Lord, uh, who had some some seizures, Father, we want to lift him up to you, Lord, and ask you to give the doctors wisdom in finding out what's going on with him, whether he has a concussion or, or something bit him. Who knows, Lord? We're just praying that you, you find out, Lord God, what it is and that you're able to help this young man, Lord, as he's beginning, barely beginning his life, Lord. And we just pray this is not a lasting thing, Father. I want to lift him up to you. Christina, who's going in for eye surgery, Lord. Uh, Diana, who also is going in for surgery, Lord. For Dina, who's came out of surgery, Father, we lift them up to you too, Lord. Now minister to us, Father. Uh, encourage us, Lord, in the hope that we have in Jesus and that this life is temporal. It, it, it's not eternal. We're just passing through. Lord, we're just sojourners here, Lord God, and this isn't where, where life <clears throat> began and ends. Um, and, and this definitely is not paradise. Uh, paradise is waiting for us and our eternal home and and place where Jesus said he's building homes for us that we may dwell there eternally Lord and, and it will be a place where everyone is perfect because we would be transformed in a twinkling of an eye Lord yes and so thank you Lord for the hope that we have in Jesus that this earth is temporal and this isn't our home Lord and there's more to life than, than just what's here Lord and we want to get the gospel out uh, to preach it to those that don't understand this Father that are almost there, Father. They're so close, and they see what's going on in the world, but yet they haven't submitted and surrendered their lives to Jesus, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will open up their eyes and their hearts to receive you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Chapter 5. So Paul's continuing on. He says, but concerning the times and the seasons. What is Paul talking about? He's not talking about... Uh, winter, spring, summer, and fall. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the times of the end when the world will be uh, going through first the tribulation period and then the second coming of Christ and the millennium reign. And then the end will, will come when Christ will destroy the heavens and the earth and create a new one for all of his children to be dwelling in for eternity. Well, the rest of the world uh, will be in the pit with uh, Satan and his uh, forces and goonies who left heaven in the first place uh, for eternity. That is what awaits us, and this is what Paul is talking about. And again, the Thessalonians were concerned about those days. When is it coming? When is it coming? And some of you might be concerned and wondering, when is Jesus going to return? And oftentimes we say that because we're going through trials and struggles, and you know it does get tiresome. And you just want it to all be over. And I understand that completely. And I think the Lord also understands that. But there's still people to be saved, right? We have to have compassion Amen. on those that are lost. We have to understand that there's still a work to be done. And we have to keep our eyes open to those that are open to the gospel. And this weekend, we've had uh, several people, I think uh, three, three, two to three people received the Lord Jesus Christ this weekend so it was a blessing and it started off I believe on Saturday morning 
when a young lady came in and just totally broken and she received the Lord into her heart with tears and so forth. And then I uh, understood another individual, two individuals yesterday receiving the Lord. So that's what it's about. <clears throat> that's what it's about while we're waiting for the return. So concerning the times and seasons, brother, and I have no need that I should write to you. In other words, you should know these things, but that's not always the case. There are new believers. There are those who are believers, but just have never read the Bible and never have listened to uh, Bible teachings on the radio or have gone to church consistently enough that they understand all these things. And so Paul's saying, I'm writing to you. I shouldn't have to, but I'm writing to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So first thing, right off the bat, he says to, you, to us and to the Thessalonians that when the Lord comes, nobody's going to know he's coming. Thieves don't broadcast. They don't let you know they're coming. Hey, by the way, next Friday at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm breaking into your home. Just so you know, and you don't get startled. No, they don't, they don't do that. They just break into your home. And, and I understand that completely. We had celebrated a Christmas, uh, wow, probably over... Uh, 35, 38 years ago in a home that we lived next to my mother. And we went uh, to her house after celebrating Christmas and I came back and everything was taken that we had just opened up on Christmas morning. Someone had broken in and just, you know, took everything, television, games, clothes, jewelry, whatever they could carry out, just gone. And they didn't announce it. They didn't let us know that as soon as you leave the house Christmas morning and go to your parents, we're going to come in and, and take everything. So like a thief in the night, they just came. And so Christ is saying, that's how the Lord is going to come. We're not going to know. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to know. And he's speaking to believers here. So no believer is going to know. So be warned that if somebody says, oh, I know when the Lord's going to return, shake your head. And so no, you don't. The Bible is very clear that he's coming as a thief in the night. No man knows a day or the hour, Jesus even said. So for, your, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, <clears throat> and they shall not escape. So one of the signs, one of the signs is peace and safety. Sudden destruction will come. So there is a sense that there's peace and there's safety. So the world will seem secure. The world will seem safe for a lot of people. They will finally look at the governments and say, hey, we finally have peace in the world. There's not too many wars. Uh, we can walk in the middle of the night and be safe. We can uh, be assured that no one's going to come in and, and, and kill us or harm us. There's a certain amount of peace that the world will feel before he comes. And then he says it's like a pregnancy. And by the way, interesting analogy because we think a pregnancy suddenly comes, right? But you know that she's pregnant because the signs are all there. You know, you, you, you don't come up to someone, by the way, and say, are you pregnant? You know, unless you really know that they're pregnant, you know. And usually you know because uh, they have this big uh, medicine ball, you know, on their tummy. Or what do you call those rubber balls, the big ones? In some cases, I mean, you just know. And at that point you go, well, you're due real soon, especially as your stomach seems to be dropping. That means the baby's preparing itself to come forth. So there are some signs that you can see as a day approaching, but we don't know the day or the hour as Jesus made very clear. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Well, if we don't know and it comes as a thief, uh, how are we not in darkness? Uh, to a certain degree we are, but we know it's coming. And so what Paul is saying is be ready every day. Uh, live as though he's coming tonight or today. Live as though he's coming today, but yet live as though he's not coming and be busy with the gospel, sharing your faith with others because there are very many people who are also lost. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. And the word sober there uh, can mean self-controlled. In other words, uh, live a peaceful life, a holy life, a righteous life, going to church, filling yourselves with fellowship and serving within the body of Christ and take opportunity to be a light out there in the world. That's what he's saying. You're not of darkness. Don't live like the world. Don't live among the world. 
Separate yourself from that. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and also, or and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So God has not appointed us to wrath. Now God's wrath is coming one day. I have a license plate on my vehicle and it says my wrath. It's not my wrath, it's not the car's wrath, it's God's wrath that is coming one day. And so it's a great opportunity to tell people that God's wrath is coming someday, but you don't have to uh, endure the wrath of God if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. But his wrath is coming and those that are his children will not suffer the wrath of God. So what he's saying here is that when the rapture takes place, it will be before the tribulation period. I think this is evidence of pre-trib. I believe God is going to keep his people from uh, that wrath that he's going to pour out, as we see in Revelation, the bowls and the lambs and the seals that were open uh, there in Revelation. Uh, a few few places that the word wrath comes to mind, uh, which the word is orge. Uh, this is a divine wrath, a reference uh, number 1646. So it is a wrath that comes from God and God alone, not a human wrath. Sometimes we make the mistake of seeing uh, natural disasters and say, oh, look, God's getting angry. No, that's not God. That's just the earth, you know, and its pangs causing havoc upon the earth. When God's wrath come, it will become to bring judgment on the earth. For instance, like the flood, that was God's wrath coming on the whole earth and destroying every man except for Noah. Revelation 6.16 says the wrath of the lamb. So it is connected to Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. It's his wrath. Matthew 3, 7, John the Baptist says concerning the wrath, uh, the wrath that is to come. So he knew it was coming. Paul knew it was coming. Paul knew that God's children would be saved from the wrath that was to come. Revelation 14 says the cup of his indignation, which is the same word as wrath. So there's a cup. And God's wrath is being poured within this cup. And eventually this cup will begin to overflow into the world. Revelation uh, 14, 19 says, of The winepress of the fierceness, wrath of God. Now that gives you a picture. If you ever saw a winepress literally squeezing the all, olive oil out of it, just com completely squeezing it so that it, there's nothing there in every bit of oil comes from that. That wrath of God is going to be poured out and squeezed everyone to death at that time. Revelation 19, 15, the wrath of the Almighty. 16, 17, the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So wrath is definitely coming and it's a future thing that God is going to bring upon the ungodly world, not upon the believers in Jesus Christ. Um, we just recently saw a couple of days ago, uh, mankind's sinfulness, the wickedness of their hearts, the hatred that they have towards human beings. We saw this man go into a mall uh, in Walmart there in El Paso, Texas, and kill up to 20 people and injuring another 26. Dayton, uh, another uh, shooting that took place. Um, Coming September, it will be, what, three to four years uh, since Forrest Holmes was, was uh, murdered by a coward who hit him while he was riding a bike and then took off, hit and run. And still to this day have not caught uh, this individual. And so this is a world we live in. It's a very selfish world, narcissistic. Uh, mankind is not inherently good. I know some people believe that. I have friends that believe that, that mankind is inherently good. And then some are now saying, well, maybe not all mankind. Now, either they're all good and there's a potential to be good or they're not. Not just some. Because who chooses that some are good and some are not? They do. Their upbringings. And I mean, this is a debate that's going on. Their upbringings, social backgrounds, their parenting, all of these things. Mankind is inherently evil. And I think we really know that because we know our thoughts. I don't know about you, but there's some thoughts sometimes, I'm like, where did that come from, you know? 
The Bible says if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. So that, that's pretty bad. So if you've hated someone, you've already committed murder in your heart because in the heart stems the murder, right? Uh, taking, coveting things you've already stolen in your heart because you want something that's not yours. So when you measure yourself with humanity, you're not so bad. And maybe there are a few good ones out there. But you measure yourself to God's commandments, let's just say the Ten Commandments, then we find out that we don't measure up at all, that we're all guilty. Because we don't love God with all our heart. We don't keep His name holy. How many times has people used His name in vain? Or go to church, keeping the Sabbath, and those are just commandments that deal with God. What about the ones that deal with mankind? Honoring your father and mother. Boy, that's one that's not kept hardly, where children honor their father and their mother. I was talking with uh, another pastor at a conference, and we were talking about accusations against parents by children. And, and this pastor was saying, yeah, that, that's ridiculous, you know, for a child to accuse their parent of anything. Um, and, and we're like, yeah, that's, that's just a harmful thing. I, and, and I said, I would probably never do that you know, to my parent. And he says, even if it's true, I would never do it because I would honor my parents that much. Even if it was true, I'd never accuse them because they're my parents and I am to honor them, you know? And I'm like, wow, even if it's true, you wouldn't do it. And I'm thinking, wow, we, we break that commandment completely. You know, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet your neighbor's goods, don't covet your neighbor. All of these things, you know, are evidence that we have wicked hearts. So there are none righteous no, not one. It's what the Bible teaches and it's what I, I believe. And so the wrath of God is going to come upon those who are sinners and have not surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. And he says here, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. So great news, guys. Whether you're sleeping, whether you're awake, because you have surrendered your life to Jesus, the wrath of God's not coming on you. So that's something to rejoice about. You should have joy in your heart that God isn't going to judge you. Um, There's some encouraging words for us. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love. For their work's sake, be at peace among yourselves. Who's he talking about there? Pastors. Pastors. Now, those aren't my words. And if I comment on this too much, then people say, oh, I see what you're doing. You just want people to sleep. No. Uh, wait, till to, uh, wait till Wednesday night. Um, we are going to get into Numbers chapter 12. <laughs> Another area. And you see it so clearly how Aaron and Miriam come against Moses, their own brother. Oh, yeah. You know, and what God does, what God does. See, what happens is we're so sinful that even our leadership, we think we know better than them. And maybe you do. Maybe you do. I'm not very bright. And all of you probably know more than me. But here's a fact. God didn't call you to that position. He didn't put you there. So it's not your place to run that position. It's the person that's called there to run it. Remember, and you guys know this story, remember uh, years ago, uh, Wednesday night, we had a <clears throat> visitor, a couple of ladies with him. And after the message, he came up to me, he says, great message, uh, just wanted you to know that I just graduated seminary school, you know, I'm now a pastor, got my degree, blah, 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 and I could have done a lot better than that, wow. you know? And I looked at him and like, wow. Now, I got in trouble for this because I said this to him, which... It just blows me away because people just immediately make me the bad guy and yet they miss the whole thing of what he just said to me, right? In other words, that you don't know how to teach and I'm so much better than you. But I said to him, I'm sure you know how to teach and I'm sure you're even better than me. You went to seminary school, you know, which is great. I wish I could have went to seminary school. I go, but here's the thing. God's called me to be a pastor here to teach. He hasn't called you. So I hope that God calls you to a church somewhere and that you teach your heart out, you know? And I got in trouble for that because I, you know, told him that he's not called to be the pastor here, you know? I'm the cruel one, you know? And yet, and yet this person comes up to me like that, mm -hmm. you know? And there are those that think that. And I'm sure he could have taught better than me. There's, there's greater teachers than me. I'm not the best. I know that. I know my flaws. 
but God's called me here for whatever reason. I disagree with him many times. Are you sure, Lord? You're making a mistake, Lord. I'm not the guy, Lord. He goes, you're the perfect guy because you know nothing. You're the donkey. You're the, the foolish thing of the world. And so if anything comes out of you, they're going to know it's not you, it's me. You know, and so they're not going to give you glory. They're not going to say great word, pastor. They're going to say, thank you, God, you actually used him. You know, that's what they're going to say. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, then I'm going to do the best that I can do. And so Paul is encouraging them here. Look, recognize those who labor among you, who are over you in the Lord, admonishing you. The word admonish there uh, means warn you. Now, they can't tell you what to do, but they can warn you. A lot of the pastor's job is basically teaching the word of God, equipping the, work, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, and warning them of what is to come. Warning them of the repercussions of living such a way, but ultimately, it's up to you. It's up to you. This young lady that um, came in on Saturday, man, I was in tears when she's telling me her testimony. And she just needed the Lord. And I was sharing with her how she's in this kingdom where everybody wants to be king, including her, and you're never going to win. As long as you're in that kingdom, you're never going to win. You'll be going in circles. You'll be up and down. People will rule over you. People do things to you. You'll do things to them. You'll not like what they are doing to you because you're king. You want it done this way. There's a lot of garbage in that kingdom. But this kingdom where Jesus reigns, if you go there, God's going to bless you. He's going to put you on the right track. He's going to heal you. He's going to bring forgiveness. He's going to bring restoration. He's, he's going to do all these wonderful things. All these wonderful things. And that's something that people just don't understand. They just don't get that. They still want to live in this world and not under this world here. And so I warned her. I warned her. I said, you need to be here. And so I encouraged her to stick around and come to church and begin to grow and begin to grow. And I was hoping that it would stick, but it didn't. It didn't stick. They didn't come to church. Of course, they went into an ungodly place, you know, instead of, you know, staying within a godly place. And so these are the choices they make. I couldn't choose that for them. Right? And I even told her, told her that. I said, I can't make the decisions for you. That's up to you. you know? And you receiving so much now and, and receiving the Lord, that's the Lord opening up your eyes. But from this point on, you have to make the decisions on what you really want. And of course, if they don't, then they continue to live that life. Um, it's just simple as that. Warning. That's what we do. So esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Of course, he's saying among the pastor and and those in the church. Now, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uh, uphold the weak. Be patient with all. So here's the Apostle Paul warning them, exhorting them. That's what the word exhort means, or encouraging them uh, to warn those who are unruly. In other words, those who are, who are insubordinate. Insubordinate to who? Insubordinate to Paul? No, insubordinate to God who are idols, they're not doing anything. And so as a pastor, there are times where you have to warn, you have to direct, you have to lead, you have to guide, and it's not an easy thing. It is hard, and it's, and it's difficult for some. It's difficult for me. I've got to pray a lot before I do that, and I'm usually praying while I'm doing it because I know just through experience that, that more than not, they don't receive it right. They don't receive it right because they, they just don't see it. They're in this world where they're king, and they want to they wanna do it their way. So remove those, those that are unruly. He says, yet uh, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one <clears throat> renders evil for evil to anyone, <clears throat> but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. If you have retribution in your heart and you get at people and you manipulate uh, to hurt people, that's evil. That is evil. Just because you don't like someone doesn't give you the right to hurt that person in any way. Even if it's gossip behind their back and you're destroying their character by other people, that's slander and that's just as bad. That's hatred, by the way, and you're murdering them. And, and that's the ultimate end, isn't it? Uh, when you begin to uh, hurt someone with words or backbiting, your ultimate end is to kill them. That's what's in your heart. <laughs> you might not say, no, I'd never want to kill them. Well, that's what you're doing. You're killing them, and no one else wants them because they're going to believe the first lie that comes at them. Be careful that you're not doing evil. No one needs to do evil for evil. Then he says in 16, rejoice always. That's a command. 
I know it's not an easy one, but we should be rejoicing always. How do we rejoice always? Focus on the things that we need to rejoice on, our salvation, that we have a home in heaven, that this place is temporal. Reach, thank you, Lord. I'm going to heaven. Thank yes. you, Lord. This isn't, this isn't forever, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Pray without ceasing. How do you pray without ceasing? Every day praying. And praying without ceasing means what? You're praying for everything. Mm -hmm. Right? Everything. Every decision you make. Uh, high school kids, if you're watching this, uh, you've got to pray what God wants you to do. Go to college or not. Uh, there are people who have gone to college, got degrees, and they're homeless because there's no jobs out there for them. So you have to pray, what does God want me? Maybe God wants me in the ministry full-time, pastoring somewhere. Maybe God wants me as a, as a missionary out there in the missions. You know, what does God want for me? Not choose, this is my career and I choose this. I hope you're prayerfully choosing it. I hope you're prayerfully choosing it. Um, I wanted to be an architect pretty much my whole life. Ever since I was in, in elementary, uh, ever, especially watching the Brady Bunch, you know, and Mike was an architect, and I wanted to be an architect, and I went to junior high, went to drafting class, went to high school, went to drafting class, took all, all the classes, went to a ju a junior college, Mount Sac, took drafting classes, and I needed a job, got hired with Edison, there went the, there went the architect, <laughs> and I became an a, a electrical testman. Um, great job, great money. And then well, there went that job, and God called me to be a pastor. So what we want and what God wants are two different things. And if you're truly surrendered to Christ, you want what God wants because it's the best thing. So pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecy. Now quenching the spirit means sinning. If you continue to sin against the Spirit, then you're going to quench Him eventually. It's, it's like any relationship. If you are ha trying to have a relationship with me, and every time you come over and say, I don't like you, and like you just keep trying, and I'm like, you know, I don't like you. you know? And you keep trying and trying and trying, and I keep saying I don't like you, what's going to happen? You're just not going to come around anymore. Because mm -hmm. I keep telling you I don't like you. So you're, you're, I'm quenching you. And we do that with the Holy Spirit. If He's leading us and guiding us, and He's... He, he's wanting us to do certain things, and we can't, no, I don't want to, no, I don't want to. Then eventually he just stops. He says, obviously, you don't want to do anything, so I'll just stop. I'll just stop. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecy. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form, or the word can be appearance of evil or fashion of evil. Boy, that's a good one, because that pretty much means everything, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, and let's close with this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is blameless, why? Because of Jesus' righteousness that has been imputed to us. So we're before God. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. So we see Paul saying, spread the word. Read this letter to everyone and every word that Paul had written in the New Testament and Peter and, and James and even John. The Gospels in the Old Testament should all be read in all the churches. Uh, I encourage you, think about this and pray about it. If you don't have a church that's going through the Bible... You need to find one that's going through the Bible. And even those that are going through the Bible, sometimes as they read the scriptures, they're not expounding on the scriptures. They might be expounding on a word. You know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And they read that and you know what it means. And then they go talk about the world. Oh, the world, you know, the world is a place and it's got beauty. And the whole message is just about the world. And they miss the whole point of what that verse is really saying. So if that's the kind of church that you're in, you know, you need to find a Bible teaching church. One that goes verse by verse and gives you the context and explains to you those verses and what Paul is saying to the church today. And I think that I do that. I think I do that very, very clearly because I don't know how to do anything else. And God is so gracious to allow me to do that. So if you are in need of a church, I pray that you look us up at calvarychapelinland.org. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for your precious word, Lord, and for the encouragement this morning, Lord, that we have 
a home waiting for us in heaven. And this place is temporal, Lord. So let us rejoice. Even though we're in pain, even though we're suffering, we might be in financial struggle. We might even be homeless, Lord. We still have a home in heaven that's awaiting us. And Lord, this is temporal. But Lord, help us in this time, Father, of our needs, because you promised that you would not leave us orphans, but you would be there for us. And so, Lord, we're praying for those that just need your help right now, Lord. Bless them, encourage them, and strengthen them, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercies today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. If you have any prayer requests, please post them or private message me, and we will pray for you. We're going to take time to pray. God bless. Have a wonderful week. And there won't be a Devo on Wednesday, uh, so we'll be meeting on Friday, just so you know. Thank you.